Hey guys, what's up? It's uh, good to be back with you again. I'm going to uh, go through a little article with you guys that um, I've uh, just recently written. So we'll show you um, a little bit of what goes on here in the back scene, first of all, of Substack, so that you understand this. This is uh, in keeping with our uh, video yesterday. And uh, we'll talk a little bit too here about this story. So uh, here's my screen. This is me, and uh, this is the uh, website. And you can see I can see all of the uh, posts I've published here, and then all the ones that I've scheduled. I bring you over here because we have one scheduled. So there's a whole bunch of posts here that are for the future. You can look at those when they come out. But the one that I want to talk about here is this one, which um, is going to come out before this video is released. Um, but which, as of the filming of this, hasn't come out yet. You see, this is going to be out on uh, July 18th, which means that today is before July 18th. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about the art of stalling along with um, the world of outs. You may have seen the video I did a little while ago about outs. About 100 people saw it. So uh, as you can imagine, I'm not exactly raking in the dough here. Um, the interesting thing about this, though, is that there was a lot of discussion around this video as to whether the actual currency of baseball is indeed outs or whether it is runs, as most sabermetricians will tell you. I maintain, and I quite firmly maintain, that actually, no, the um, uh, currency of baseball really is outs. And I think that this story illustrates it very well. So a big shout-out goes off to uh, one of my friends, I won't mention him by name on Facebook, who mentioned this story that I was unaware of before. Back on, uh, this is uh, July 14, 1915, the uh, Philadelphia Athletics went into Chicago for a game at 3 p.m., since we can see that right here, and it was on a, a very overcast day. The White Sox looked pretty good, um, and uh, we're uh, right in first place at the time this game was played. Philadelphia was actually in seventh. This is the 1915 Philadelphia Athletics, which, as you know, is the team that uh, totally fell apart after uh, Connie Mack sold off all their stars. He was um, allegedly worried that they were going to go to the Federal League. There's a lot of uh, rumor about that, and uh, you really need to go read um, uh, Norm Mock's um, series on, Ty on uh, uh, Connie Mack to really get the full feeling for what went on. Personally, I don't agree with the idea that, oh, yeah, Connie Mack just sold them out because he didn't want anybody else to touch his players or whatever. I think that's kind of a conspiracy theory. Um, but uh, you can read um, what you want. Now, the interesting thing about this is we can go back to the Chicago Tribune, and what we can see here is uh, what the weather report was. Normally, I go to newspapers.com and show this to you, but instead, I kind of want to show you this to you here on the blog, right? Because we were talking uh, yesterday about what Substack is like. This is actually what Substack looks like when you draft something. So you can see. I can write ASDF JKL colon, and it shows up right here on my Substack screen. I can remove it, and uh, it will save all of this automatically. This is the um, C saving changes, draft saved. And so it is. We can put in you know links and photos and all sorts of other stuff. You can't do quite everything, and it has some trouble with things like GIF images, with video that's not already on YouTube and stuff, but you can do a lot with it. So this is the way I do it. It's really nice. What you see is what you get. Here's the weather report from for July 14th, 1915, and uh, it was pretty set on rain. Not 100%, but it was pretty clear that it was going to rain. And guess what happened? It did rain. This game was totally bizarre. Uh, so uh, the interesting thing about this game is that there was a rain delay in the uh, top half of the second inning. Um, and after about 20 minutes, the rain stopped. It brought a temporary cessation of aerial leakage, and the game was resumed under difficult conditions, right? Who knows how many fans decided to stick around for this one. Now, the uh, thing that the game uh, summary does not tell you here is that uh, the uh, White Sox were up about 4-2 in the bottom of the fourth inning. And uh, that's when the Athletics decided to uh, start stalling the game. And so they did everything that they legally could to try to stall the game, including not throwing any strikes to the White Sox hitters. Right, and so what happened is um, uh, Red Faber, the uh, White Sox pitcher in his second season that year, came up to bat as the second batter in the inning after the uh, first guy struck out. Blackburn struck out on um, wild pitches by simply swinging at anything that was pitched that was even remotely close to the plate. Faber came up, but uh, they hit him with a pitch right away, and so he w reached first base, and then he kept going, went, ran up to second, ran over to third, and then ran home. Nobody tried to tag him. Now, you're probably thinking, why in the world is nobody trying to tag him? Well, what's happening is the Athletics are behind in the bottom of the fourth inning, and they want to try to stall this game as much as they possibly can so that the rain will come and wash it out. And it looked like the rain was absolutely surely going to come. 
right? And so suddenly, for one of the few times in the history of baseball, it was in the interest of the offense to make outs, and it was in the interest of the defense to not make outs. And that's exactly what happened. And so Faber was credited with three stolen bases um, on a uh, single play, stole second, third, and home for three of his seven career stolen bases. Um, And I'm surprised that they um, allowed him to uh, have that. Um, (laughs) They uh, somehow were able to uh, finish uh, the game and convince the Athletics to uh, continue playing. And uh, then the game kept on. In fact, the funny thing about this is that there was no extra rain delay. Connie Mack and those guys um, guessed incorrectly. Um, There was um, a steady drizzle that came down, but they didn't stop the game, and they uh, didn't uh, uh, end up uh, postponing it at all. And um, in the very end, the uh, Chicago White Sox ended up winning 6-4. to four. Game took an hour and 40 minutes, which is amazing considering all the crazy stuff that happened. And, yeah, there were three steals by uh, Faber. In fact, um, you can see it right here. Stolen bases, he was credited with three. And uh, when we go down here, when we look at uh, this is from the baseball reference page. Um, you'll note that uh, he's given credit for stealing second, third, and home, as we do have the play-by-play account of this game. Uh, Lena Blackburn, before him, struck out, swinging at every pitch that came by. Le- uh, I'm sorry, a Leibold, after Faber was done stealing every base, struck out as quickly as possible. And then Buck Weaver um, decided uh, to hit a ball, so they actually pitched to him. He doubled the right field, and you'll notice that he was then tried. He was uh, put out for trying for third base. Now, don't ask me why they allow that. Why they went after him instead of just allowing him to score? Because if it really was going to rain, you thought the game was going to be postponed. You want to go ahead and allow him to score, right? This is kind of a roundabout way, and there's all sorts of other stuff here as well, but it's kind of a roundabout way to tell you that the important thing to notice here is that the run is completely superfluous, right? If you're down 5-2 to two, uh, right before a rain delay wipes out the game, or if you're down 500 to do, it doesn't matter. The thing that matters is time, and the way the time in baseball is measured is through outs, not through runs. The most basic unit of measurement in baseball is outs. It's always been outs, and this is the way that we have to look at the past and we have to understand things right there's a lot of implications that come in from this that are not very popular and one of those implications is that our advanced saber metrics that are geared towards measuring everything offensively and defensively in terms of runs is actually i would argue measuring the wrong thing you need to think about the game in terms of outs because in many cases it doesn't matter how many or how few runs you get the thing that's important is that you're able to put the other team out and that you're able to manage whatever you're going to do offensively within the certain framework of outs that you're given that's the thing that's most important that's the thing that you have to keep in mind we run into problems all the time you've seen this before on these videos and you'll see it again in the future when we look at the uh, domination index we look at the number of runs scored and the number of runs given up as they uh, relate to what the average is and how the standard deviation works and stuff like that it's a simple measurement but we will get and we will continue to get strange teams that sort of rise to the top and when you start looking into it you will see that there are a number of games in which they're winning by a large margin right it's not a bad thing to get a whole bunch of runs but in many of these cases it actually is meaningless it doesn't mean anything at all and winning the game three to nothing is the same thing as winning the game ten to nothing arguing that one team is better than the other team uh, because one team won more games by a larger margin really isn't a great argument in the end. It is not, right? There's a good argument still to be made that uh, one loss percentage as a team is more important than messing around with a bunch of runs. It's more important than the Pythagore- Pythagorean theorem and the uh, Pythagorean uh, projections and stuff like that. And this is exactly what the argument is, which is that the important thing in a game is to win, and you win by putting the other side out. It has very little to do with runs other than the fact that when all outs are made, you want to be at least one run ahead of the opposition. That's a different way of looking at it. So it's a little bit um, sort of a different perspective for you. This is different than what all of the sabermetricans will tell you. Um, I'm not aware of anybody else who's written like this or who sort of thinks like this. But if you sit down and you really think about baseball and how it's played and how it's designed, you're going to understand what I'm talking about and why this is important. There's another funny thing about outs. I don't have time to talk much in much detail about this today, but this is coming. The real funny thing about outs is, though we think we understand a lot about fielding, I would argue that we don't, right? If uh, the center fielder gets more putouts than the left fielder or the right fielder, it's not because his uh, left fielder or right fielder are bad by any means. 
nobody cares who gets the put out. What you care is that the out is made. There are some times where it is important how the out is made, right? If uh, it's a uh, one-run game and uh, the other team is uh, down and they try for a squeeze play to uh, give up an out at first base so they can score the uh, run at the plate, you really want to cut off the run at the plate if you possibly can, obviously, right? Because life and death kind of depends on it, right? But it's very, very rare for you to care a lot about whether the center fielder or the left fielder made the catch or whether the shortstop cut off the third baseman and made a spectacular throw instead of letting the third baseman have the easy throw or whatever i mean i don't know does that mean one person is better than another honestly probably not right the point is to make outs it doesn't matter that much how many strikeouts your pitcher gets right his job is to make outs and guess what if he can do it in a more economical fashion where he doesn't use as much as uh, much arm energy and arm strength he's not throwing out his arm every time up and he can last a little bit longer in the game it might be a good thing for you because then you can conserve your bullpen and uh, you can save your good uh, relief pitchers for a time in which they're needed. And usually, at least in the history of baseball, your better pitchers are your starters anyway, right? Because the important part is it doesn't matter how the out is made. What matters is that the out is made in the end. In the case of this particular game we were talking about, the important part um, for the offense was that the outs were made so the game could be official. And the important uh, part for the defense was to prevent any sort of out from ever being made at all so that uh, the game uh, would uh, continue indefinitely until rain came and saved the day. So there you have it. That's uh, my uh, latest thoughts on the art of stalling and on outs, and I will talk with you later. Bye-bye.